my previous video, I showed the construction of an RC2014 Z80 based computer. The RC2014 is a kit that has similar hardware to the first homebrew machines of the early 80s. Out of the box it runs basic, but with the addition of more RAM, a compact flash card, you can run CPM, and that's something I'm going to look at today. So on this computer, the board is connected to my PC through an FTDI USB serial cable. And then I'm using the fancy new Windows terminal to run Windows subsystem for Linux. And in there is a copy of Minicom that communicates with the RC2014. I'm using this convoluted mess because the Linux serial terminals work much better than any that I've found in Windows. They support all the ANSI escape codes, I can make them full screen. And if you look, I've got a nice size font so you can see what's going on. It also didn't require much configuration, although later you'll see me messing around with this trying to make it work a bit better. So unlike BASIC that is on most old computers, CPM is a real operating system. It understands floppy disks, hard disks, serial ports, printers, you know, all the kind of general things you'd expect to find on a real computer. It's what inspired Microsoft to create MS-DOS, which, whether you like it or not, was a really really popular thing that a lot of our current operating systems are all based off as well. So CPM is kind of the main thing that started a lot of general computing as it is today. Some of the popular DOS programs started life under CPM, like WordStar is a word processor, and that was what we used before Microsoft Word. So yes, there was a time briefly before Microsoft took over everything. What I'll do is investigate CPM a bit. I've never used it, so here I am just messing around with a bit of coding using Turbo Pascal, which is something I last did about 25 years ago. And it's not bad really. Everything seems to work as I expect it to. There's no weird funny lag on the keyboard. The screen sometimes goes a bit strange, but that's to be expected. I'm using a dodgy Chinese USB serial adapter plugged into my PC and about three layers of abstraction to get the text on my screen. However, the main thing to get across is that this is an actual real computer. It's not a microcontroller that's running a bit of hacked code. It's not an emulator that's on my PC that I'm compiling code and then uploading to the real machine. It's an actual physical working computer. If I had a serial terminal, I could put this in a box by itself and just run it as is. So the first thing I need to do is get the machine configured. On this board here, this is the ROM board. So it's got a big ROM chip and there's a lot of different jumpers. These jumpers configure which part of the ROM the CPU can see. The ROM is 256k in size, which is far too big for the CPU to address in one go. And also the code doesn't need to be that big. So instead it's cut up into 8k blocks. And these page selection jumpers physically change which address lines on that chip are connected to the CPU, which in turn configures which ROM the CPU thinks it's loading. This is the RAM board. It's got two RAM chips on it, which makes up 64K of memory. And then there's a set of jumpers as well, and a bit of support logic. What you have to do is correctly move these jumpers to set where in the address space of the CPU these memory chips appear. Now, this is a bit strange because if you think about it, the CPU expects there to be memory at a certain location. For the Z80, it expects it to start at memory address zero. So when you switch the machine on, it starts looking at whatever's connected to memory address 0 and starts trying to execute the code there. Now, if there's a ROM chip attached there and a RAM chip at the same time, then you're going to get conflicting data on the bus and the system won't boot at all. So those jumpers are just where the CPU sees that memory and you have to sort of push it up the address space a bit so that the 8K that's used by the ROM is not being overlaid by the RAM. However, later to run CPM, you need to do some clever paging tricks that the hardware does so that it can then page out the ROM and put back that 8K of RAM so that CPM itself can see RAM all over the address space because CPM doesn't think that there's a ROM chip in the machine it just expects RAM for the whole 64K What you've also just seen me do is adjust the clock board as well it's got an extra pin on it that sends a reset signal down a reset line that can be used to automatically reset the machine when you first power it on and that line is also shared by the memory paging system in this machine. So what you have to do is disable the auto reset system and then that line can be used by the ROM and RAM boards to tell each other when to page in and out different sections under the control of the CPU. 
It took a while to debug and figure this bit out, but eventually by moving enough jumpers around and turning it on and off enough times, I figured it out. What I'd maybe like to do is get some dip switches or some other way of adjusting these jumpers because at the moment I have to keep pulling each card out and flicking them round. However, at the moment I don't think I'll be using anything else apart from CPM, so I won't need to move these too much. Later I think I'll investigate the memory monitors and see if I can learn some Z80 just by typing it straight into the machine. But for now I'll just reconfigure this back to basic and we'll go and have a play in that draw some fractals. Here we are back in basic. This is what most 8-bit machines started up in. If you're used to writing in a modern language, basic's quite painful. I mean, it was painful to use in the 80s too, but it's mostly all we had, unless hand assembling machine code was your idea of fun. I found this basic code that draws a Mandelbrot image using ASCII characters. I've typed it in and it seems to run okay. I'm not quite sure if that's a Mandelbrot image it's generating, but it's doing something interesting anyway. So this is one of those fun programming projects again that I was on about. I've got this piece of basic code that I found off the internet. I've just verified that it does indeed work and seems to draw something. At the resolution of these terminal screens, I can't really tell if that's correct, but I can see the general outline of the Mandelbrot set appearing. So I've got a fair idea that this will work. What I want to do is turn it into Pascal and run it. Fortunately, this basic program is quite short, so I can look through it line by line and generally just see what's going on. There's a bunch of variables being declared and there's a few loops inside it. This is one of the main problems with an unstructured programming language such as BASIC. When you're trying to debug it or at least read someone else's code, it's impossible to work out the general structure without actually going through it line by line and interpreting it, much like the computer does. So if you get lost part way through and you can't remember what a variable does, there's no convenient way of just like visually seeing the shape of the code. This is why languages such as Pascal and later C and other languages that are now more modern became so popular. It was so much easier to write code when you could visually see what you were doing and think in slightly more higher level structure. Basic to me always seemed a bit like someone tech an assembly language and just added more words to it. It was very linear, top to bottom, with just jumping around to unknown numbered lines to figure out which section of code you're going to next. It made it very hard to debug. Now because we're working from things in the 80s, we also have to use manuals from the 80s and I found this really nice Turbo Pascal instruction manual. It's got really nice artwork. I find this kind of programming quite fun. It's sort of recreational in a strange nerdy kind of way. I mean, the skill of writing Pascal on a CPM machine is completely obsolete and useless. But the more programming I do, the more I learn that the algorithms are the important part and the language is just a way of expressing it. Like, if you're not a loopies and you know how variables work, then you can learn a new programming language fairly quickly. You just have to figure out how to express those ideas using a different syntax. And occasionally, you'll find that what you used to know is now irrelevant and that there's an even better way of doing it. But it's still the same algorithms underneath. Somewhere in here I get a bit tripped up because I'm trying to break out of a loop and normally you just write break, except this version of Pascal doesn't have a break statement. So instead I've got to use a dirty, horrible go-to and a label. And yeah, it, it feels nasty. I don't like doing this. I'm quite pleased I can still remember some of the things that I last did 25 years ago though. Like, I've not typed in Pascal at all until today. And all I've done is looked at a little bit of a refresh on how the syntax looks and how you declare variables and the rest just seems to make sense. The thing to remember is that all of this is running on that tiny little computer that I built. It's not on my PC. I'm not compiling this in Windows, uploading it like a microcontroller and then making it run it. I'm actually physically typing this on the machine itself and it's compiling it. This is all running off an 8-bit CPU running at 7 MHz with 64K of RAM. You know, squashed inside there is a complete operating system that back in its day was as big and popular as Windows is now. It had proper full price software and people made a living writing for it. You could buy computers and they will come with this pre-installed and then you put it in your office, use it for word processing, hook it up to not the internet but other places and send work to people. It's how things used to be. I've built several little computer kits in the past and they've either all been based around microcontrollers or they've just not been that powerful. You know, at some point you hit a limit with what you can do. Either you can't save your software and you just end up having to paste it out of a terminal, 
or there's just no software with it, so you end up with a system that you can't do anything with other than load a few sample programs that you've typed in yourself. With CPM, I went around the internet and within about 10 minutes I'd found more software than I'll ever be able to go through. So if you've used CPM in the past, let me know what you did with it. I want to explore this more. I want to figure out what else I can do. I might try some of the more exotic and weird programming languages that were popular back then, see how they work. But as you can see, I've managed to create a little Pascal program that's now happily chewing away through some maths and doing a slightly better approximation of the Mandelbrot set than when it was in BASIC. It wasn't that hard to do, but untangling BASIC and turning it into structured code is really, really painful. You have to sort of understand what the code is trying to do and not just blindly type it in one line at a time. One of the tricky parts of using this computer is trying to get data into it. So it's got a compact flash card, which to CPM is really about 16 floppy disks or possibly hard disks, I'm not quite sure. Whatever they are, each one is about 8 megabytes each and formatted in a special CPM format that this particular computer understands. I can't just put the compact flash card in my PC and copy files onto it. It really is its own thing. Instead, I need to do a clever trick. On the A drive is a file called download.com which accepts text that you type in on the terminal and it converts that into binary data and writes it to the disk. So on my PC I have a Python program that kind of does the reverse. It will take some binary data, turn it into this special encoded text format, which I think is just literally the bytes written out as numbers, and then I paste that into the terminal and it's as if I was typing it in. So I can copy and paste like a 10k file and download.com will turn it into the actual original data back on the compact flash card. The tricky bit though is that there's no error checking in this. It is literally just pretending to be me typing on the keyboard. So if things get out of sequence a bit or there's a communication error and it pauses for a bit or characters aren't sent as they should be, nothing knows and it just keeps blindly typing this mess into the machine which you can see going on at the moment and sometimes the only way out of this is to reboot the entire machine or quit the terminal program and start again. There's more to computers than programming though. Ever since we've been able to program the things, people have wanted to play games on them and CPM is no different. I'll save you the 10 minute mess of me trying to figure out WordStar. Let's just say, there's a reason people back then used to be sent on courses to learn how to use software. You know, you didn't just open the box run the program and start clicking on icons on the screen. Often a lot of the commands were not known to you and really not obvious unless you either read the manual or someone showed you how to do it. Like even things we take for granted today like being arrow keys and delete buttons on keyboards, they weren't commonplace. Instead, that kind of thing was done with an escape code where instead of the text being something to print on the screen, it was sent as a command that the terminal interpreted and there's lots of different terminals out there, especially back in the 80s. So you had to know what terminal you were using and then figure out how to make the program work with that terminal. Some programs even came with their own configuration utility and asked you to type in the escape codes for each button that they wanted you to map. Or you'd buy a machine from a particular vendor and they'd have the software packages that you wanted to use already edited so that they worked with that particular machine. It really was very specific back then. And now I'm trying to use a modern PC with a modern terminal program. And some of this stuff just doesn't work without a lot of effort. But you can buy games, or you could find games online. So let's explore one of the most popular ones. This is Zork, which is a text adventure. If you've not seen them before, it's a bit like an interactive story. There's a paragraph of text, and then you can type in commands about what you want the game to do next. Either directions to move in, looking around, picking things up, or interacting with stuff. These games weren't really my thing back then. I preferred the graphical versions of these with a point and click interface. I just kind of got bored reading screens of text as a kid. And now I just don't have the patience to sit and read through this, just to work out that I want to go N. Especially when some of these games are incredibly convoluted on purpose, just to make the game drag out a bit longer. And I never liked that deliberate confusion that was put into some games just to kind of give you a bit more game experience because it was often illogical problems that you'd never solve without someone telling you the answer. So here I am, blundering around in Zork for a bit and I'm about to get eaten by something that's lurking in the dark. So now I've got a working CPM computer 
I want to do more with it, I want to explore it in a bit more detail, but I don't know what else I can do. I've found software packages, but there's so many of them I just don't know what to look at next, and I could do with some ideas. One thing that I think might be fun is to take the computer apart and trace it out and figure out exactly what happens when you turn the power on, and like where all the data goes and where it comes from and why it does what it does. That'll take me a while to figure out though. So in the meantime, if you've got any ideas of what I could run and mess around with, just let me know in the comments below. I'll see you later. Don't get eaten by a Gru. Thank you.